Chad Milchman, and I am um, I'm Mark Madison, I'm an adjunct in the environmental studies. I'm Mark Holstock, I'm an assistant professor. Right, and I think the first question that I really wanted to ask, because the question of this whole idea thing is, is, is what does what do these ideas say about our place within the universe, about what what we're supposed to be doing and, and who we are as humans? And um, Sure, like our place in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a piece of cake. That's a piece of cake. Uh, I mean, you know, can I speak to that? I can speak to my place as a human within this institution. That sound good? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, with Darwin's birthday, uh, you know, thinking about evolution, I think that we've moved to a place where we can talk about literature as and ideas as embodied thing. This is this is the gift that Darwin's and scientists brought to us. And that's that's how I, I understand uh, literature and, and understand our place in the universe uh, as moving in that direction. And I think we have to find ways in the humanities to make those connections to embody the physical aspects of realizing that we're eating everything. Doing. It's a physical the needs that we're trying to meet are also so this is where I teach um, well for me I, I, I find myself straddling the line pretty much everything that, that I do um, I, I am an atheist I'm very proud of that. just to say that I'm an atheist uh, but I surround myself almost entirely with religious music that as the director of choral activities, pretty much all that I do is, is not only religious music, but uh, music of Western Christian tradition, uh, and because it is the greatest music that, that, has ever, uh, that has ever been composed. Tonight I'm about to go conduct at a concert uh, for, uh, for Mardi Gras um, uh, at uh, St. James Catholic Church downtown doing entirely religious music. Uh, I find no conflict uh, between those things uh, in in our in our place and, and in my place, and then because um, I think it's important always that through these times uh, of uh, of needing to express how important evolution is and how fundamental evolution is to the greater world, that um, we always be respectful of religious tradition. Uh, and I'm deeply respectful of the religious traditions of the students around me. I find I find faith, even if I don't share that faith, I find faith to be a, a beautiful and wonderful and, and precious thing. And I always want to encourage the faith of the students in, in their own beliefs, even if I don't personally share those. And as we sing uh, music that those students don't necessarily share, I want them to be respectful of the faith that they're singing about as well, so I must be respectful of their beliefs. Where I draw the line where I think it's important today is when those beliefs uh, intrude upon science. Um, when a, a, I have no truck for anybody to profess a belief in, in God, but if somebody then professes a belief that, well, God tells me that the Earth is 6,000 years old and, and created Adam and Eve and evolution is a lie, I'm going to have the exact same reaction to them as I do my, my uh, left-wing friends who say something similar about how vaccinations are evil and, uh, or profess new age crystal healing or, or whatever. Uh, and that is, you are wrong. Uh, and there is no, there is no wiggle room. There is no fuzziness in that. You are simply wrong, and it is important that you that you separate your beliefs in what cannot be proven by science from those things that can be clearly demonstrated from truth through science. So, as we come together today to celebrate Darwin's birthday, I think it's important for all of us to to be respectful, deeply respectful, while not in truth, while not shining from the things that actually can be demonstrated false or true. And, and I'll definitely speak to a lot of those issues. 
uh, later on in the talks, but I wanted to turn to my right um, and see what Dr. Madison see what you had to say about what, what evolution had to say about other uh, better places in the world and how it's actually a person. Well, first you put together a very diverse panel uh, because I actually uh, not an atheist. I've been an elder in the local Presbyterian church. I'm not um, And uh, I mean, Dan is a, a biologist. Um, got my master's in organistic and evolutionary biology. Uh, and then became a historian, which is not as odd in the leap as you might think. But uh, evolutionary biology, which is my passion, uh, is, is one of the most historical of my science. Recreating a history, and that's how it connects. In interesting ways, also to the literature, um, and I think you know, having studied and, and made the first half of my career evolutionary biology, it doesn't necessarily offer, I think, tremendously useful lessons about how we should live our lives as humans. Uh, nature uh, seems rather cruelly uh, indifferent uh, as to how individuals lead their lives, but where I work now. Um, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the environmental organization. Um, I think there, there's a, there's a strong lesson in that. Uh, it's at the very least rude uh, for one species to, to uh, work actively to the detriment of millions of other species. So if there is an interconnectedness, almost certainly that, that offers uh, an ecological ground for the fundamental ethics. And, and, and I wouldn't look to nature for any um, laws and so on. I think that's what people look to religions for, just as I wouldn't look to religion for. Um, to explain the physics or the life sciences. People that practice those um, different disciplines I love to train. Did you have anything to say? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that's not so good to say. <laughs> uh, the, as, a, as a political scientist, it lies, it, it, it's a, a little bit different. I think we, we tend to look at, uh, at issues of power and uh, so the issue of superiority comes up very easily, and uh, of course, uh, many political scientists are therefore very easily uh, uh, going back to uh, natural selection and those kind of issues because that creates the idea of, of, of superiority. Uh, I personally actually uh, like to think much more towards adaptability and the possibility of. Uh, of change and making things, uh, changing humankind or the animal world uh, to the environment in which we live. Uh, and humankind is part of the animal world, that's uh, what intended to say there. And, and as such, I think that is much more um, a, a, a optimistic and uh, progressive look at the world. Uh, by which we actually can think about the world in, um, in, in a makeable world, uh, but understanding that the environment is still an important part of the world. And, and I, I want to thank you for bringing that up, because that's what I wanted to come to next, because I think the most profound thing that Darwin gives us is this idea that humans are a part of nature, and that we're not outside of it. And I was wondering if any of you really want to speak to that at all. Oh, well, that's, okay. that's, that's like my baby idea. Lives, right? I mean, some of my students are here. It's just something we talked about a lot. Is how um, out of an evolutionary need, we seek to create a grand, grand sense of self in literature and religion and faith are parts of that. So they have an evolutionary function, right? a narrative function to create a sense of self. And I think that what Darwin and Pence help do is pop a little bit of that, that bubble and create the potential for a kind of self-reflection, self-encouragement, um, inaccessible to us. And the fact is that I think, you know, OGs in general are intended in some ways to blind us to this. It, it, it is, I agree, a, a fascinating question. Um, we are, as far as we know, basing our senses apart from other animals. 
is that we are the only creatures that are aware of our own mortality. We are the only creatures that, that know that we are going to, to die one day. And that, that gives us a certain sense of reflection and, and an innate need, I think, to, to try to look beyond, to try to figure out, well, it, it, does that mean that I will stop existing one day? And, and because of that, I think it, it, does, it does maybe set us apart from, from, the, from the animal kingdom uh, because we are burdened by these philosophical ideas that, um, that, that no other animals are able to, to think about. And, and I think that that's a danger because we must always look at ourselves as being simply one of a continuum, that we are special by what we can do but we are not risen above uh, the rest of nature. We are, we are reliant upon the rest of nature in order to exist, in order to thrive, and therefore we are, our great burden is, is as caretakers of the rest of nature. Yeah, I mean, a couple interesting things. I mean, uh, it, it was a big debate when I was a graduate student in evolutionary psychology, what separates us from animals. I think mortality is, is the most obvious one. It's kind of mind blowing deer don't know that they die. Um, Until they bounce around the car. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the other things we do uh, that might be um, a little less horrifying, and, and obviously I'm biased here, it's a different story, is um, we're a history making animal. Um, so one of the interesting things about humans is um, we can learn from our mistakes, uh, and we can leave a mark on history even if we are mortals. Now the environment is a great Everything in the life science, and this is why evolution is so important, everything in the life sciences um, that we have today basically derives from Darwin. There is no ecology until Darwin. The term is coined by his German advocate, Ernst Keckel, about a decade after uh, the origin of species, uh, and, and, and the, the earliest inclination of ecology and the environment as we understand it comes from Darwin. And the most important thing he does um, is, is he replaces what has been basically supernatural answers for why the environment looks like it does with natural answers. And that's why the vast majority of churches actually have no um, issue with Darwin. When we talk about science versus religion, we're talking about a small subsection, basically evangelical churches. The Catholic Church um, gets a bad rep uh, for locking up uh, Galileo and so on. actually has no problem with evolution, uh, surprisingly enough, because they're concerned about uh, less of a physical body than the uh, immortal soul. Church I go to, most of um, non evangelical Protestant denominations actually have no problem with evolution. And, and, and that's why it probably it is to a certain extent a misnomer uh, to talk about you know, science versus religion. What we're really talking about is science versus uh, a number of people who don't want to accept the modern world or science. It's almost science versus anti science. And yeah, I guess it's better. And I think that that's, I think that's an important realization to make when we discuss some of the issues surrounding evolution in our social world because we have this misconception that is in some way opposed to some of them. It's only opposed to some of them and not all of them. Um, Dr. Holtzak, did you have anything that you wanted to add to this? I, I think that kind of put my standpoint out there in the first answer, but I, 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 I cannot stress enough to, to say how much we are part of our living environment. Uh, which includes humans and, and, and animals, and uh, there, there would be no us if it wasn't for the, the larger context, and, and I think that's abundant. <coughs> I, I would like to just point out one thing, though. Um, I was just looking up the uh, most recent Gallup poll on evolution, uh, and uh, well, <laughs> 46% of Americans do believe that God created humans in, in present form. And I would imagine that the vast majority of those objections are religious objections. Um, and, and certainly a lot of major independent uh, evangelical Protestant churches out there do uh, explicitly deny uh, evolution as a concept. So I, I do think that well, certainly there's no question that a lot of the major religions uh, do not have, have a problem with, with evolution that still has mm -hmm. permeated down to the down to the base levels you know, in America. 
Yeah, I think it's arguable. I mean, is, it, is that anti-modernism, or is what we talked about before an innate human desire to feel special? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only humans can question. joke or feel and, and, and you mentioned it's a tricky one. Yeah, I'm no defender of religion. That's not my and, and, and you mentioned Galileo. I think it's the same, the same issue of, of us being the center of the universe. Right. Yeah. Um, I think there's a big distinction here as well. The last two words he said in America. Well, it's an important yes. understanding, mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, as an international person, it's, it's, uh, you know, that's not the understanding throughout the world. Um, I, 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 I sort of wanted to speak personally about this. I think that the, the way that Darwin sort of affects my view of it is that because I think it gives us sort of a sentimental idea of where we come from and who we are. It's sort of that idea of being a product of these millions of years of, of this simple but complicated process. And and because it's funny because I've been recently sort of preoccupied with my family history. And it's that same sort of idea, I think, of being part of a grander history. You know? But uh, I wanted to move on and, and talk about, because and we come to this a little bit, talk about evolution and morality. Because I think it's an important thing to come to, both in the sense that, that morality has evolved, and that in a lot of ways we could say that evolution is an immoral process. So I wanted to start over here. Dr. Madison, I wouldn't would speak to that. I don't think a scientist would call it immoral, and it would be amoral, basically. You just, there's, there's very few lessons that can be drawn in nature, even though that's been a, a standard trope. I'm sure there's the professors can tell you among nature literature it's pretty common to pull lessons. Um, so that's why I think uh, it's bad to impose morals on nature and uh, okay. but the lesson you can take is, is we evolve like every other species on the planet. We're having a disproportionate influence on them. Um, and that is probably going to be bad for us and other species. So I think it's really amoral. But what what could it aim, it's amorality did for us was make it possible to imagine Morality as 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 a as a human construct, not as an absolute phenomenon. Right? I mean, it, it sort of provides you this ability to destabilize anybody's claim to a certain rightness, which is glorious to me. Right? I mean, it's just such a relief to not have to think, you know, think that there is a fixed kind of law that uh, operates um, as if outside of myself or my students, or that there are, aren't a projection of needs, like in culture or a person, whoever's in charge. But while evolution itself is amoral, which I completely agree with, the consequences of the understanding of evolution can be profoundly immoral. And we've seen this throughout, throughout history where, you know, where the, the simplest way to change human evolution is to remove certain people from the gene pool, not let certain people reproduce. And, and that is a profoundly immoral consequence. And I think that we need to recognize, while that doesn't change the truth of evolution, I do think we need we need to recognize that by attempting to manipulate evolution to our end, we can engage in profoundly immoral behaviors. Well, but Anthony it was the, the ideas of what he wanted to talk about. It. This was the question I thought about the most because I I think it's very difficult. But social scientists tend to uh, tend to bring the moral part into it, and. Uh, I think the other part, and because uh, in, in how you had presented it to us, it was linked to culture. Yes. And if you look at American culture and, and, and think of the uh, expansion West and uh, the ideas of um, the American dream, uh, these are evolutionary ideas. They're ideas who, who find their origin in uh, the superiority of men over nature and the idea of uh, the superiority of one man over the other man. Yeah, and men here meaning human beings, of course. Uh, as such, uh, that brings them, if you fail, yeah, then you are a less superior, a superior human being. And uh, there is almost a moral stigma uh, in society placed upon them. 
And that's a very cultural issue uh, yeah. that, that, that comes out of human beings, but also out of social science. And yeah, I think that, that that stigma really plays a role in the lack of public acceptance for Darwin. And I thought it was interesting that you brought up Manifest Destiny, because one of the things that interests me about Darwin is that, is that, it, uh, <laughs> is, is that it comes up at a, at, a, at a really ideal time for it to have a negative influence, because it comes up about 20 years before the scramble for Africa. It comes out about 20 years before the sort of American colonial expansion of the Pacific. So, and and it's it's something that we have to acknowledge is that these theories have been put to to less than ideal use. Um, but I did want to bring up culture, and and how do you think over here has evolution affected our sort of cultural understanding of the world and our culture itself? I mean, in the broadest sense, that what comes to mind for me is just that it opened the door for a new way of thinking about what constitutes the truth. You know, because you all of a sudden you have uh, morality. I mean, I think we tend to basically think about the sort of moral assessment. You know, uh, but evolution allowed morality to be removed from um, interrupting our pursuit of an idea of one or the truth. And to me, I think that, that it opened the door to that kind of possibility. Right? It changed everything. It changed everything. So you can all of a sudden ask a question that's that's problematic. You know, you, I think it made it possible. I think that you know the evolutionary story made it possible to see morality itself as a way to not have to avoid the truth because there's this new possibility a way to not have to think about the truth. And I think that any time there's a moral uh, decision about something, it, it actually is a nice way to not have to think about what's true about the situation we're in. And I don't think without that theory, that kind of thinking about what's true would happen. That's sort of a rejection of, of, of Pangloss and his best in all possible worlds. <laughs> Come back to me, I'm still chewing that over. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, what you were talking about a minute ago, I mean, one of the problems with that historically is some of these bad ideas of trivia evolution, like social Darwinism, it exists decades before Darwin. Well, of people involved this and, and the social Darwinians and then the eugenicists, a lot of these ideas on race and so on predated. And, and I just have to mention as a historian, the other person that was born on this day in 1809 was Abraham Lincoln, so it was a very auspicious day. I actually shared the Anything uh, comparable or not here, thank God. Uh, but the cultural things predated, and, and, and Darwin's pulling from these cultural metaphors, and, and, and other people are pulling from them, but they're, they're really inappropriate uses. I don't think the Germans really were uh, students of natural selection. They were racist, they say. In World War II, they certainly were students of Pull that out. And the, and the cultural thing, the other thing I used to <coughs> tell students when I taught. Darwinism and evolution of biology is like it or not, it can be an evasionist if you want. You live in a Darwinian world, basically. The way we understand the life sciences, really the way we understand our world um, is evolutionary. There's no lot. And in fact, people understood the world in an evolutionary manner um, by the by the mid 1800s. Um, so you can deny you can live just like the Amish and Mennonites do as an anti-modern, anti-scientific resistance, but it doesn't change it. The, the importance, though, of, uh, of, of Darwin for, for the pre-existing ideas is that it gives it a, a scientific foundation. Sure. Sure. And it, it validates it, and thereby it becomes much more acceptable. And, and, and that allows, I would say, indeed, uh, the ideas. And I, I wouldn't go as far as Hitler, but I would go into the ideas of uh, you know, the, the criminology. Uh, yeah, uh, where you start studying uh, the, the eyebrows and, 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 and facial features and these kind of things. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, but but it validates it, and that is that is a very scary thing if you have to be very liberal. I also think that culturally, until Darwin, it was not that it's particularly socially acceptable right now in this country, but I think it validated the ability to be an atheist. Uh, that before before Darwin made it to be an atheist perhaps was considered immature 
because, well, how did we all get here? How did all of this become supernatural explanations were the generally accepted explanation for, for everything, including our, our own creation? And until Darwin, um, it, it, I think he made it possible to be the completely intellectually fulfilled atheist uh, and be able to explain the existence of pretty much everything without having to turn to God uh, right. in, in the gap. Exactly, exactly. And that might be the most profound cultural change. And, and I, that really goes, comes to our next question, is that Darwin exists in a naturalistic world. It exists in a world that rejects the supernatural. And and I think and the question that I have here is, is where does where does art and where, does, where do the humanities, where do the non-rational, if you will, parts of our, of our society fit into this naturalistic world? Well, I might object to calling art not rational, but I, 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 uh, I, I, I suppose I can start. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I guess for my, for my purposes, I, I go back to say it does um, because the mystery of the mind, the mystery of creation, is still a great, great mystery. How do people conceive of ideas? Uh, brand new, or how do you know how how, how what if, what is the profound sensation that we get through performing art? I mean, I mean, I don't I don't doubt that all of these have, of course, naturalistic definitions. I'm not saying that there is anything supernatural to it, but there is a certain mystique that surrounds the creation uh, of art, and certainly in, in the creation of music, the feeling of community that we get, and it's a very passionate thing for, for me to be a conductor, and, and in, in a lot of ways as being a conductor, this is my worship, this is, this is my, my temple, I, I, I worship at the idea of music all bringing us together in one community of performers and listeners in, in, this, in this one great masterpiece. And I, I'm completely okay with that mystery not being solved. I'm completely okay with non-Darwinian explanations for that um, because I, I like to believe in, in mystery. I mean, I, I call myself an atheist, but I will say I certainly would love there to be a God. I, I would love there to be uh, a supreme being that brought the universe into existence. I just know that there's no need for it. And perhaps for me, music is how I how I touch the, the divine, even if that doesn't exist. And I think that's okay. I think I think those can be in conflict with each other and 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 I can go about my day and say, I have no problem with the conflict. You have to learn to love the questions. Right. I I would say art is function. And as such you know, it, it plays a role in our, in our environment, and uh, we thereby create art as, as part of our environment. It's, it's just another expression of us belonging to the world, uh, and, and uh, that's, it. I think, it, the best answer that we get to it. I mean, to me, I think that the evolutionary story made it possible to make art a kind of replacement of, of religious spirituality to the literary or artistic spirituality. It kind of opened the door, right? You have this, you, you know, ontological, the chain of being as, as the vision of the art is vertically oriented, right? Where you have intimacy with God, your, your, your story of who you are is based on your proximity to you, how close you are in your image to the divine. And then all of a sudden, Darwin sort of like flips that, puts it on the elements of thought that, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, literary spirituality really did start to replace a religious spirituality in the 17th, 18th century. I would just add one quick point. Yeah. Uh, there was a smart point about atheism, but the, the term that came out of Darwin was that actually agnosticism. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas Henry Huxley, his, his, his most vociferous proponent in England, uh, coined agnostic shortly after the other she said, you know, this, this is where we should be questioning in a, in a quickly changing world, which it was. As regards literature, I am probably 
creating the least artistic anything of <laughs> this group. So as a as a historian, it's amazing what a rich, uh, at least in the theory I know best, written literature you get immediately after Donovan, the first generation after Donovan. Everybody from H.G. Wells to uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Tarzan to Jack London, um, suddenly these evolutionary, especially nature, read into the clause, survival of the fittest, metaphors, um, greatly rich literature. You just see them emerge and get a lot of fascinating I think literature, for example, is one way to also trace that there was a need for something like Dar what Darwin was yeah. going to say way before Darwin said it. You know, sentimentalism was all about the senses of the body. They called it the sympathetic nervous system out of this, this movement, right? It was not really what it was. It wasn't the sympathetic nervous system. It wasn't like natural passion was the body of the thing Life. That's what people were starting to believe, looking and craving for new kinds of stories that, that uh, understood us differently. I'm going to put a meter uh, corner. <laughs> 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 so, so I think that the the Yeah, I, I, 
the question was kind of do we see it in other things? And of course, I, I go immediately to, to what I study, which is international organizations. And, and the interesting thing is, of course, that they develop, they adapt to their environment, and they. Uh, but there is this very liberal uh, national structure. Uh, that's the interesting part. Uh, it, bureaucracies in general tend to survive because they, uh, because the human beings who create the bureaucracies are uh, are passionate in, in, in making them survive in any way possible. Uh, but it's always through evolution. Yeah, it's always through adaptation to the environment in which they live. And so if you look at, for instance, NATO, the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which there is no use for NATO in its original concept anymore because the Soviet Union is gone. So what did they do? Well, there is a war in Yugoslavia. Hey, middle in the middle of the war of Yugoslavia, NATO changed its, it changes its mandate so that it actually can get involved, what they were already, into the war of in Yugoslavia, and thereby now can be in, in uh, Afghanistan, in Iraq. Uh, yeah, all these possibilities are now there because hey, there was no use for the original species, but we can adapt the species to be what we need it to be. Yeah, and I think that's where, where evolution is actually quite interesting. The, um, one of the things that I often have a problem with uh, regarding evolution is that people often refer to it as being a justification for narrow self-interest. Uh, when, when you look at people like you know, Ayn Rand, uh, and saying that, that that the selfishness of the individual is the greatest good of all. And I think that that is a, while it might be somewhat true of Darwinism, that of course the strong survive uh, and, and, and go on in the struggle for survival, what it misses, I think, is the fundamental understanding that we are all part of a, of a larger organism, that no organism exists on its own, no organism exists as, as an island. It is, it, is, um, it is always exhaling and inhaling certain things. It takes other things from its environment and it gives out other things to the environment. And that that is part of evolution as well. It is not just the individual struggle for survival, it is also the struggle of survival for the whole organism. Because if, if one incredibly successful organism uh, is able to produce poison gas into the rest of, of the atmosphere that kills off everybody else, that one successful organism might survive for, for a time period, but the rest of creation dies because of it. And I, I think it's important that, that we remember that evolution isn't simply about the, the strong to survive of the individual, it is also the balance of survival of the entire meta organism. And I think that we see that process going through different cultures throughout history, where, where cultures that have had sort of traditions that are that are helpful for survival have carried on while others have. Um, Dr. Madison, did you want to? Well, I came in late to avoid this question of the TED But look, uh, from a from a biologist perspective, there is no such thing as cultural evolution. Um, it's it, you know somebody who's thought a lot about this and, and uh, atheism. Richard Dawkins right coined a whole new word, me, to try to say you know really evolution is talking about disseminating genes. Although Darwin didn't know about that yet, um, and generally the survival of individuals and adaptation to the environment. Um, cultural evolution, human-based cultural evolution, um, isn't. Uh, necessarily a natural process. Um, and in fact, a lot of Darwin's ideas uh, are presented as a contrast between human adaptations and, and, and natural adaptations. So humans can breed and dogs or exactly pigeons uh, and nature evolves species on its own in a slightly different way. So I mean, from a biological perspective, I don't think evolutionary biologists are comfortable today. Um, Talk about evolution and culture. How do you, how do you, I mean, how does, how is anything not natural? Do you see what I mean? Like, if you're an evolutionary biologist, how do you, how do you not see culture as an expression of nature? Like, even technology, like, how is it? It can, it's an expression of our evolutionary capacity. 
it, it's it's a difference between as, as a state of, yeah. <laughs> it's a difference between evolution and natural selection. So, but you, you're talking about two different things, though. Evolution is a is a broadly encompassing thing uh, that can mean all sorts of things. But really, I mean, it's Darwin Day, and if we wanted just to contrast it to exclusively natural sciences, we're talking about natural selection, evolution by natural selection, and it's something seems to have happened with humans um, through culture. Maybe that's a great. Difference. I think yeah. where it evolves in ways that sometimes aren't adapted to the environment, perhaps. We've talked about that with the environment, or in ways that don't have an immediately applicable um, adaptive use. Music drove Darwin to mass. How could um, musical ability uh, of such a fine degree evolve in birds and tear it up ways? <laughs> he never could explain the kind of drill of, you know, what's the adaptation for that? Um, and, and, and so there are some challenges. And I, I think that that goes back to what Darwin wrote in his second grade work about sexual selection. You know, this sort of idea of cultural factors playing into the biological factors. And I, I, I liked it that you brought up mimetics because that's something that really interests me. I think one of the things that's missing from that is a selecting factor. It, because right now it's sort of this it's sort of anarchy where there's nothing that there's no drive to have things be beneficial. It just creates this immense diversity for better or for worse. Um, let's move on. This is where things are going to get a little bit exciting because we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about evolution of schools. We're going to up the ante a little bit here and talk about evolution of schools. And let's just start off by asking what are your sort of your general views on evolution in schools, and, and especially, and sort of, should we be talking about conflict theories in the class? That supposes that there is an explosive theory, which there's not. And that's the problem, that, that all of modern biology is based on evolution. There is no conflicting theory, because evolution is simply not certain. And if, if there were legitimate conflicting theories with evolution, they would be discussed. But there aren't, and therefore there is no room, certainly not in the in the scientific classroom, mm -hmm. for you know uh, creationism or young Earth or Adam and Eve or anything like that to be uh, discussed. There's plenty of room for the mechanics of evolution, for for all of the for all of the mysteries that we still have in the, in the processes of evolution, how they work, and, and all of that. And the history thereof, yes, but there is there is no there's no more room to discuss the other side of, uh, of of evolution as being creationism as there is room to discuss uh, astrology and the astronomy class. I think a little bit of a philosophical uh, point on this, where I think we have to think of what do we want our schools to do. Why do we have schools? Yeah, and in my feeling, if we have schools to to lay the basis for uh, our understanding of the world, yeah, if that's the case, we we have committed ourselves to science. If we have committed ourselves to science, there is, as you say, no other. There's no and therefore there is indeed within the sciences at least no no reason to look anywhere else. And, and I agree with you. Uh, yeah, if we talk about, I don't know what they mm -hmm. in schools, uh, in that, uh, you know, if we, if we accept that, that it helps us understand the world, then, yeah, then, then there is a, a room there, but not in the <coughs> sciences. No, I personally think there shouldn't be anything off the table in terms of what it is we can analyze. I think religious faith is a cultural phenomenon. It's an object of knowledge. It's an object of knowledge I can never so um, I don't think there's any, <laughs> the door is closed, like you said. But as an object of knowledge, as a phenomena, as an evolutionary phenomena, it's primary, it should be on center stage. There's things, these are the things that are closest to people's hearts, you know, whatever, whatever, however, whatever metaphor you want to use to describe how people feel about their commitments. Our commitments are, I think, the physical experiences, but that aside, whether you spend there as a soul or not, um, 
it should be on center stage. And I think it's I think we should be embarrassed that we're even going to talk about this sort of stuff more forcefully and aggressively and, and have it um, our deepest commitments be on, on center stage because why we're we're nervous about what people feel and, and think. And therefore I, I think you're accepting that truth is not your objective. Mm -hmm. and, and inside. Schools are fascinating. I got kids in three different schools right now in the local area, and I guarantee you, I know their teachers are teaching in controversy, which is, as you said, non existent. It's an interesting history. Evolution was taught without problem in this country until about 1920, disappeared from the textbooks really until the 60s or so, and, and now it's come back. And, and it's worthwhile trying to understand. Uh, the opponents, because they're they're not stupid right? scientifically, and they're not stupid. And, and initially, they, they tried to bring in rather crude creationism, um, young Earth, and so on, and that pretty quickly um, got kicked out. So the, the second tier was to, to create something called intelligent design, which goes back way before Darwin. People say, you know, how, how did I evolve? How, how did it become so? gel on a bacteria evolve. But it's the same idea. There's many beautiful things out there. How could it evolve piecemeal? It must be the creator, divine artisan. So they, they brought that in, and that really didn't stand up to science either. And it's interesting why it didn't. Um, because science, although it's a planet, has a methodology. And, and, and the two most relevant components of it are a scientific theory has to be reproducible and falsifiable. And people don't often think of falsifiable, but if you say there's a god, it's hard to falsify. How can you prove that it isn't a god? God can be high, or whatever. Um, and those two things, intelligent design doesn't really um, meet those needs. And, and, and so now they're trying to um, call it teaching the controversy. So you don't have to teach our creationism, pseudo religious nonsense, but you have to say there's questions about evolution. And then this might be one answer, which would be creationism. And that, that has another fallacy. This is a purely logical fallacy. Um, and that's the argument by ignorance. That's arguing, because there's a flaw in your theory, um, my theory is right. So um, because you can't immediately tell me uh, the diameter of the Earth, uh, I'm going to say the Earth is flat. And that's what they're arguing. Because you can't explain every single step along the evolutionary process or go back and reproduce uh, these steps. It took millions of years to happen. My theory is right. And, and so, they're, they're not even arguing on the same plane. They, they don't have a scientific argument, so you can't debate them along those lines. They don't even have a logical argument. Um, because they're saying the cracks in your theory and they to prove my theory. That doesn't make any sense. It's like a book writer, um, as opposed to the creator uh, author um, trying to you know, say, well, I have a book. I'm not going to critique it. I'm not going to separate the book. Um, so there's really no reason for it to be. It's not a science. It's not even a philosophical argument. Any um, first year undergrad, um, so there's really it's a point to discuss. And I remember once again being in the grad school, you know, biologists were saying, well, you know, we either need to engage them and discredit them or not engage them. But the reality was, from a philosophy of science perspective, there was no common ground to engage them. They were speaking a totally different language and making up their own rules about logic and science. And, and that's why it's such a stupid theory. And that's why it really does a disservice. There's no critical thinking to it. There's no educational value at all. It doesn't, you know, you, you'd like to think. You can teach it as a philosophy, but you can't. It's so illogical. You don't think you can teach it as, um, as, a, as a historical. Um, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's another side, though, that if you, if you relate it to the, uh, to, to the media debate about, uh, about climate change, yeah. Um, where uh, you get undue um, attention to scientific and faulty uh, theories, and then you create a misunderstanding of the world. So you actually undermine the principle of what what you're trying to do, what the role is of schooling, and as such. Um, you have to be very, very careful with this. In fact, to the point where I would say the best job probably not engaged at all. There was a wonderful study that came out last year that showed when somebody holds a false belief, 
when you demonstrate to them that their deeply held false belief is false, they're actually more likely to hold to that false belief, not, not less likely. You cannot argue with logic a belief that has not been arrived at logically. I think people have to come to that on, on their own. So in general, I, I agree, you just, you just simply have to say, hey, I'm really sorry, you're wrong. If you'd like to read more about this, you can. Because they do, they follow their own rules, they, they will go up and, and argue, you know, the second law of thermodynamics, or, you know, abiogenesis, and uh, things that have, uh, or they'll find something that this picture of this spotted moth was faked, and therefore all of, all of biology, and, and they'll find the tiniest little holes that have been well explained, but ignore the vast holes and issues with, with their own processes. So I don't think that you can, engage them successfully, all you can do is simply lead the horse to water and, and let them let them think on right. Here's where I mean I like to point people to Jerry Coyne's book, Why Evolution is True. That that's my go-to book now saying if you want to read more and understand about evolution, this is this is probably the place to go. But I will just get my temper up. If, if they continue to try to engage me on, on logical fallacies that I've been over again and again, it's like playing a pigeon in chess. You know, if, if, if they have their own, uh, you've all heard that metaphor, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but, but, well, it, it, they'll start all, all over the board, knock pieces over, and poop everywhere and say, I won. Um, <laughs> but, and, and, I, and I think that that's bad because all it does is it makes us look to be arrogant jurists. And that doesn't change anybody's minds. I think we have to be kind, gentle, and say, I am sorry that you're wrong. <laughs> you know, I think that Darwinian reason is, is amazing for its, its humility. I think the idea that uh, it accepts uncertainty. I mean, that's what makes it so great about you know, bringing about critical thinking, is it's, it assumes uncertainty and embraces it as a, as a Phenomenon, knowledge. So it totally embraces uh, a kind of uh, uh, uncertainty, I and mean, that's why it's important in schools. It allows questions, it demands questions, it expects them, assumes them, and embraces them as a permanent feature of the model. Whereas uh, there are very few other faith commitments, belief commitments, or moral commitments that are willing to swallow that. Uh, and therefore, there's no critical thinking. I think belief is uncertainty, almost. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think where you don't believe yeah, are you, exactly the opposite. But you bring up a profound point. What, what evolution does, it's beautiful. It's, 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 it's my favorite belief system. Uh, I think it's, it, what, it's courageous. But it evolves. And it, it changes. And that is where a belief system is different. Right? Or we're just yeah. electing a new pope. Uh, sure. Well, that, that's been a, a pretty static uh, procedure for centuries and so on. Evolutionary biology the has changed. The procedure is better, but I wouldn't argue that the fact that church has changed over, uh, <laughs> all no. over the 2,000 years it has been to be. But I think scientific theories evolve. I mean, the, the, the understanding of well, I would argue they evolve too. I, 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 I don't know, but the, 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 the what is it, the, geez, I'm being honest with you, so long ago, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know the, the, these proclamations in the 60s, you know, uh, in which they, they profoundly uh, changed the, the view of the world, uh, I think is, is a show of evolution within the church. They embrace certain kinds of evolutionary ideas when they said, well, these are the models by which we're going to judge what a saint is. So but, 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 know, but again, it's, kind of, it's an adaptation to mm -hmm. the environment in which they live. And and I would actually argue one of the reasons why Ratzinger is stepping down is because he is not of his kind. And he realizes that he cannot make the changes that the church needs. I mean, as an ex-Catholic, this is exciting. This <laughs> for me it is. I think overall, a belief system, unlike a science, can use a 2,000-year-old test. Um, and it doesn't have to. I don't know any science 
that doesn't change generation. The way I was taught biology as a high school student is not the way high school students are taught biology. So the but, way but, I was but, taught physics. But don't we have the same principles from the lying in biology and physics uh, and, and, and our understanding of the sciences? And you see, this is, to me, I, I mean, going back to political science, I always say Americans treat the Constitution as the Bible. Yeah? And the, the problem is that they do not allow any change in it. But that's not how, uh, how, we, how we're supposed to, or, uh, you know, that's my, my moral question. Uh, but, you know, that, I don't think that's how the Bible was intended. The Bible was intended as the principles, and the, it leaves open so much interpretation. And the interpretation, and this is what you see in, in Islam, this is what you see in, in Hinduism, the explanation of the principles changes according to the environment. And as such, uh, you know, that is not different from the principles that underlie under our understanding of the world. I have to say, I think that you're getting to the core fundamental strength of science and why it is not only the superior way to understand the world around us, but the only way to understand the, the world around us, because, uh, well, first of all, the idea of theory is very much understood, and people say, well, that's just a theory. Mm -hmm. Well, theory is simply a hypothesis that has failed to be disproved. I mean, I always like to like to explain to, to non and I'm a non-scientist, even though I, I like to study a, a lot, but that science doesn't deal in facts, Science doesn't deal in truths. That when a scientist creates a hypothesis, they do not set out to prove it true. They set out to prove it false. Mm -hmm. And they devise every possible way they can think of to prove it false. And they say, oh, uh, everybody else in the world, please try to prove this hypothesis false. And by its failure to disprove the hypothesis, does it then become a theory? But every aspect of that theory is still falsifiable. And all you have to do is falsify it once, just with one time and the whole thing falls apart. That's the strength of science, that is always demanding new evidence and is always changing based upon the evidence that comes forth. If this evidence doesn't fit the theory as it exists, well then the theory has to evolve and it has to change. And anybody who would look at that as a weakness of it doesn't understand the science. I think that the, the, the problem that we, we sort of face is this idea of science as, as a thing instead of as a process. Because science is sort of our, uh, I think it was Dr. Sagan, who said that science is our way of, of interrogating the universe. You know, it's sort of this, this, it's not a list of facts that you learn in the classroom. And I think that that's one of the big problems, not only of our scientific literacy, but also of our scientific classroom. I hate to be the one to defend the religion but, you know, I, in principle, I think religion is meant to be a process. Uh, the, the problem is that we get uh, people who are too much into it become pragmatic about it. Or, you know, it's not what I'm looking for. <laughs> I can't uh, find the, the, the right word here, but who, who, who take it as a... Uh, as a set thing, as you said, as a dogmatic, as a dogma, yeah, it didn't become dogmatic. I mean, you know, I, I, the only thing I would question there is is that I think that I, I'm not sure projecting back onto the writers of some of these texts that people believe it, that they intended it to be a transformational process. Mm -hmm. I think that its intention is actually to be very fixed, whether they liked it or not. We interpret things differently. So, for example, like uh, evolution made it possible to reinterpret the Bible as a political document and read it in, in, in a very specific kind of close textual way. Uh, new hermeneutics, right? But so now we can rescue it on the life on the life raft of um, it was intended to be read in multiple ways. And I, I think that that's a, that's actually an argument that tends to rescue it, in, in, you know, in a certain way. I think, you know, theories like uh, uh, Michel Foucault and basically says that power, you know, shift, shifts around whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. Violence happens at the moment you resist its transfer from one to another. Right? And so religions don't embrace those shifts. They resist them. 
they happen whether religion likes it or not. So I, that's the only thing I would add to, to the description. They change the meaning, but not because they are committed to, unless there's a cultural critique under which they're under the gaze of a popular culture that says, we're not going to embrace you unless we see you will embrace change, right? In the 60s, but it's just a, a nuance to the argument. No, I agree. Yeah, um, before we start taking questions from the audience, and I hope you all have a lot of questions, um, I want to sort of just go ahead and ask if there's anything about Dharma and your, your particular um, field that you wanted to, to get to today that we haven't gotten to. Yeah. Ever since I ever since my college days, I've been interested in reading from biologists as well about Darwinism. And the thing that all these years up until my late age now, um, dealing um, in and having knowledge about the law of thermodynamics and laws of, of, of light and laws of gravity and laws of magnetism and knowing that we're tweaking those laws all the time. There's not even a law is in concrete, right? We tweak them all the time, discovering new things, the God thing, all these little things that keep coming in all the time, including the age of our universe, and nothing beyond 13.7, nothing. Is that true? I don't know. But here, all these years that we've been talking about the theory of evolution, Darwin's theory of natural selection. Um, at what point in time do we uh, give up the word theory and put the word law on it, even though it might tweak, 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 tweak through time just like everything else? You know? Are we ready to put the word law in front of that? And why isn't it in front of it, or will it never get in front of it? There's a historical reason. Yeah. The, the historical reason is Newton called his physics laws. Darwin always used theory. And, and, and really, in, in a way, it's a historical problem. Um, but also, it's changed a lot. I mean, um, within the field, you know, keep in mind Darwin had no genetic theory. Right? That came up with Mendel and the discovery in the 20th century. Um, so he didn't have a way for uh, favorable characteristics to be inherited. Uh, and then, um, well, there have been a number of changes, but one of the most startling ones was probably uh, Steve Gould's uh, punctuated equilibrium, right? And if you read Origin of Species, that, that, that well, of course, I used to force on that. Everything is, is, a, is a slow and, and, and pretty much um, consistent process, and, and, and the paleontological record seems to show that, that evolution can happen in the growth of spurs, depending on isolated population and so on. So these haven't taken away natural selection, but they, they've augmented it and added to its, its nuance and, and depth. Uh, but I really think it's just a, uh, it's just a historical anachronism. Physics tends to speak in laws ever since Newton, uh, biologists being a humbler sort, uh, and perhaps deservedly so. Uh, we we, we talk in theory, so I okay. I think it, it also has a lot to do with the nature of, the two of physics versus biology. Biology being a little bit softer than physics is. You know, it's more observational than it is experimental. In, in my opinion, laws only belong to math. I mean, because you know what? I'm sure math is the only thing which can be proven. I mean, you can have a mathematical proof. There's no such thing as a proof of physics. Uh, I, and and to me, using using the word law is just an inappropriate word because it's always being tested. You you can you can prove something in math to the point that nothing can ever disprove it. You can make a mathematical proof, and once you made that mathematical proof, what you are literally saying is, this cannot be disproven. And you're right. You can never say that in, in, any, in any realm of science. To me, words really do matter, right? Like, so if you, have, if you choose a word like law, it does uh, the opposite of the intention of, of science. It tries to create the same fixity that religion does as soon as you change the word. You know, so if you want, you want the looseness, you want the, but I could be as, Arrogant and egotistical as I want, it doesn't change the humility of science. It's a phenomenon, right? Um, and so you, I think you just want to have it maintain a language that is as non committed 
to itself as the word theory has been able to sustain, sustain a lack of baggage, which is quite phenomenal as words to do that. My immediate reaction was lost on the wrong conditions. You know, that morality. And, 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 and there we have an evolution of law. Yeah. And I, you know, uh, as, as a trained lawyer, I, uh, I actually object to the idea that the law is sort of set in stone. Uh, in, in, in true, by definition. Yeah, by definition, an evolutionary process. Uh, and as such, I think that the use of law in the sciences, uh, at least the understanding of the use of law, uh, is a misnomer. Uh, and, and I think we should look at the judicial system a little bit closer. Uh, or, you know, don't use the understanding of law for the sciences for the judicial system, because that's what we have to see in society. Okay, um, coming back, I'm going to go to the next question. Um, so, in psychology, we do have laws. <laughs> we have three. No, four. Uh, <laughs> not the laws of robotics. So we, we have Fechner's law and Weber's law and Stephen's law and the law of effects, which seem to be the lawful relationships with it. But, but I want to run something by you guys, something that drives me absolutely bananas. I want to see what you think. So I hear a lot of people saying that there's no point in arguing against evolution because it's true. It's just that's the way it happened. It is irrefutable truth. But as a scientist, I think that's ridiculous because it simply it represents our current state of knowledge and I think we're incredibly arrogant to think that there's no way we could be wrong. Because at one time, the Earth was flat. It's obviously flat. Go outside. It's true. It's just true. Right? So, so what I always tell my students is that it's a theory. It represents our current state of knowledge. It could change. It could be completely wrong. There's no way for us to know. Is that, do you guys agree with that, or do you just completely out of it? I, 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 I agree with it on, on some level. Um, but I, I, I think that where I disagree with it is that in order to argue against evolution as a concept, you would have to have a hypothesis which took into account all of the available evidence that we have, the fossil records, carbon dating, genetics, everything that we have, and you would need to come out with a hypothesis that encompass all of that evidence to say, this is the demonstration of why that evolution is not true. And I guess we're right now where I come out and say that, that there is there no opposition to it is because the opposition is creationism, because the, the opposition is intelligent design, laughable, easily falsifiable, contrary uh, ideas to it. I would need to see a comprehensive idea. Could I admit the idea that evolution could be false? Absolutely, because I mean, obviously it is science. But there would need to be some some clear, intellectually consistent opposition to it, and that's exactly what that's exactly what I'm saying. So I'm not saying that there is an alternative. I'm just mm -hmm. admitting that there could be. We just haven't found it yet. But you know, if you embrace truth from the, from the get go, not as ever possible as an absolute, it doesn't. The question doesn't almost on some level <laughs> matter because it always if there's always a kind of commitment at the given moment. Whether when you call it a truth, you know it's it's never fixed. If you commit the idea that truth is not an absolute thing ever, right? It's interesting because earlier we we linked Darwin to agnosticism versus atheism, and I think that uh, if you make the claim that uh, that uh, evolution theory is absolutely true, uh, then you're an atheist in that sense, meaning you. The yeah, idea you, you create a new belief system, whereas if you're agnostic, you allow for the possibility to that there is uh, that you are wrong. I, I actually present it that way. So if a student says they believe in God, well, you don't have to not believe in God. It may be that the world was actually created. We weren't there. We don't know. <laughs> how, how, would you, how, how would we know? Exactly. But that idea doesn't help us understand the observation that we make or make any future predictions. That's not a theory. Mm -hmm. So. Would you guys be comfortable with that? So saying that you know evolution might be wrong, but it does a lot of work for us right now. As I, yeah, it's obvious. But the problem is um, scientists don't necessarily take a historical perspective on it. So historically, natural theology, which is really a 
earlier, more rigorous version of uh, creationism. At about a 1400 year run. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I was looking at the beginning of that, say, or at the end of it, I'd say, gee, we've had this theory for 1400 years, nobody's gotten around to disproving it yet. This must be right. And then Godwin comes and messes it all up. So obviously, any theory has changed. But even more specifically about natural selection, um, some of the things Charles Darwin was particularly interested in have changed to such a degree. Um, I think he would think that his theory is, is, is quite different. And really, the, the, the whole concept of, of varying rates of evolution, isolated populations, really wasn't what he was thinking. He talks incessantly about thousands, if not millions of generations, and this very slow evolutionary process. And that's not really the way we understand it. It doesn't diminish its, its beauty and grandeur. But um, it changes. Of course it changes. And, and you know, Newtonian physics we've had for 300 years. He said relatively new things. It would be fools to bet on them not changing. But that doesn't mean the sciences aren't what have given us this university and this culture and everything good we have in our society and um, aren't our best snapshot in the world right now. And I, I disagree with if you're a strict evolutionist that you have to be an atheist. No, 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 that's not what I said. I, 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 it was it was an absolute guess. I think I think that we always get in trouble with the word absolute. But I think that you know, keep in mind once again, the, the, the most vociferous proponent of evolution in America was a, a, a botanist named Asa Gray. A gray herbarium in St. Louis, a major botanical repository. Um, and he was a, a devout Christian. The co discoverer of evolution. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace became a spiritualist. Um, so I'm not sure, and Darwin was almost clearly an atheist. I think there, there's really no doubt now. Um, so I'm not clear that there is a connection between um, your scientific beliefs. And that way, in any of your religious beliefs, I think just, I, I don't yeah. see that. No, no, I, I was using it as an analogy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not as a, as a label. But I think it's a conflation, <laughs> oftentimes, from the religious <laughs> end to say, well, if you're an evolutionist, I don't really see historically any evidence of that at all. The, the, the most atheistic scientific profession uh, is physics. It's not life science, by far. Um, and once again, I don't know what to do with these things. Because uh, there's a spectrum from atheism to um, religiosity and that is I'd like to build, though, on something that, that uh, Professor Lohenschmidt said earlier, and that is that words matter. And, and so while, while I certainly agree on a, on, a, on a basic level, of course, everything that you say is true, the problem is people run with it and say, it is possible that evolution is wrong, therefore, Ebony. And they'll, and they'll make that, that happy leap right there because you've admitted the possibility that you could be wrong because there's no possibility that they're wrong. And since it's possible you're wrong, no, not possible they're wrong, therefore they're right. And I, I, I worry, I, I try, I, I do try when, when talking with people who do not uh, understand or accept evolution to use more simplistic and simplistic terms because it's so easy to get caught in the weeds uh, with them of, of their belief system. Just like for me, I, I, I have no conflict with the idea that I'm an atheist who believes in God. You know, I don't find the things contradictory because I'm an atheist because I am an a-religionist, and the word a-religionist simply doesn't exist because I, I do not believe in the truth of any religion here, and therefore atheist is the simplest thing to say to that. But yet I accept the idea that, hey, sure, I'd love it if there was a God, if there was some a superior being who brought the universe into being, or if we live in a computer simulation, or, or some, something that, that caused us to be. And yet I find it useless. But, and, and especially because atheism is so often a revival term, that it, I would I would like to embrace that. I would like to I would like to have that be more accepted. And therefore, even though I do not state that there is no God, I find calling myself an atheist to be the simplest shortcut and the most embracing of of what I of what I believe. What, what you said though, that if they make the leap of faith of um, Therefore, there is a, there is a, a Adam and Eve. They stepped out of the conversation mm -hmm. uh, because they changed the parameters under which you are discussing. Absolutely. And this is, and that goes directly back to the question about schools, uh, where 
uh, you know, we need to have a common language. And it seems to me that we have that we have accepted that the common language is scientific. But then you cannot suddenly step out of that common language unless everybody steps out of it. Right? Everybody involved in that discussion steps out of the common language. And, and that's where the problem lies. Um, we're just about out of time. I, wanna, I don't want to wrap up until we miss. Are there any other questions? Okay, so actually, I do have a question. Um, you saw from here um, religion and evolution as opponents to one another. However, today, listening to this conversation, I've heard as uh, I've heard religion as part of evolution as it has developed over time. Um, maybe, maybe a little bit of elaboration on that. Maybe it's been developed as the beginnings of common ground and culture, so that um, let's say. Uh, so maybe a social perspective could be brought. Uh, maybe social groups, you know, grew up around that. So maybe it's the evolution of groups. Maybe it was brought up there. The idea of thinking together. Yeah, well, group selection too is, is a no-no uh, for evolutionary biology these days. It came in and then it kind of went left. So, um, but you bring up a, a good point. Well, really, what happened is, is a hundred-year uh, change at the beginning of physics, moving to geology, and, and probably culminating in biology of removing supernatural causes for for physical uh, changes. So it begins in physics with Newton, Charles Lyell, and geology, and pushes it, and then Donald does it. So, so you're pulling all supernatural causes, using supernatural not as good, but as a broad term, anything that's not a natural process. Religions that don't care that much about it are fine with it. Um, religions that care a lot about Adam and Eve, and Mary and the 6,000 year old earth, or so on, are obviously going to have a problem with that. But I think, uh, you know, we talked about all the bad effects of evolution. Certainly, many of the good effects are in the field I'm in now, which is the environmental sciences. And once you feel like you're a part of nature, and other people have said that more openly, um, you almost have some moral responsibility um, not to destroy the, this thing you're interconnected with. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's a fear too, perhaps for some religions. You know, create nature for your God. And people brought that up right after John. Some do. Um, but you know, there are, that, that's a moral lesson that really can be told. If you are connected, um, you might want to err on a second car if you not interact with your environment. Here? Could I just make an announcement? Yeah. There is a bus going from Jefferson County to the um, rally in Washington, D.C. Um, to protest climate change um, and the XL pipeline. If anybody's interested in the bus, let me know. It's going to be about 9.30. What time? Pardon? What day? Sunday the 17th. This, this well, if there aren't any more questions, I think we can, we can wrap up. I want to thank everybody for coming. I think we, we got to a lot of things. Um, come take our stuff. Come take our stuff. That was a tiny answer. There's, there's a lot of things. Um, yeah, I should.